Hi, this is day five of this unit. This unit is called totalitarianism, and today is a new kind of fascism, Nazism. So take the fascism of Italy and develop it one step further, and there you go. Today's focus question is how did Adolf Hitler make Germany a totalitarian state, and how did he make that totalitarian state a thing that was controlled by the Nazi party? So as you can see, we are on day five, um, the rise of Nazism. Hopefully you've done your reading to catch up until now. Question number one, what was happening in Germany that made people start to listen to Hitler in the 1930s? A lot of things going on in Germany in the 1930s, but the most important thing that caused all those things was the Great War. World War I, the Great War, destroyed Germany just like it destroyed Italy and Russia and everywhere else. But in Germany, things were even worse. Why were things even worse? Because at the end of the war, not only was Germany destroyed, but it also owed money to France. Um, the Treaty of Versailles required that Germany pay France back for all the damages caused during the war. So where is a country like Germany to get money that they don't have? Loans. So Germany borrows money from the US and uses that money to pay France, but now Germany owes money to both France and the US. Due to that and many, many other reasons, the German economy was a disaster. Um, many people were struggling with poverty, people were struggling with all of the things that go with poverty, you know, uh, lack of housing, lack of money, lack of food, lack of all of the supports that society generally has. And you have a lot of people living sort of a very hand to mouth existence. They're struggling financially, they're struggling intellectually, emotionally. The country is depressed economically and psychologically. Prices for things go through the roof. We have massive runaway inflation. Um, things like um, bread go from you know a very low price to up to 4.6 million Deutschmarks for a single loaf of bread. We have scenes like the two on the top of these uh, the top of the screen right now, where you have stacks and stacks of cash for buying small purchases like your groceries, or this giant uh, bucket full of cash uh, to buy you know one loaf of bread or something like that. How do people respond to this? Well, a lot of people are depressed and um, and, and emotionally uh, upset by this. And other people kind of go the other way. Some people kind of want to forget all their troubles and forget all the problems. And, and they kind of go to a hedonistic, um, devil may care kind of attitude. Um, and this is the growth of the Weimar nightclub culture. It, there's a sense that all of the old rules don't apply anymore that nothing matters anymore, that war is just going to kill everybody anyway. Um, and so why even bother? And so a lot of young people are drawn to this nightclub culture, a culture of, you know, sex and drugs and jazz music and, um, and nightclubs where there's lots of, of drinking and drugs and, you know, brand new things like cocaine um, become popular, um, you know, uh, women dancing and taking their clothes off and strippers and you know all of the things that you might think of as part of nightclub culture become pretty popular among young people in Germany. A lot of people feel like morality no longer applies. They feel like the whole world has sort of broken down. Um, and the more conservative people start to be scared and they start to look for answers. They want to fix society and uh, this ends up leading to people following the Nazi party. Question number two. How did Hitler blame the problems of Germany on other people? So Germany was a depressed country, economically, socially, intellectually. And uh, Hitler came along with his book Mein Kampf. Um, and you have all the background to this in the previous lesson. So if you, uh, if, if you feel dis disoriented by the sudden appearance of Adolf Hitler, back up one. Um, Hitler published a book called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. In it, he talks about his personal struggle um, and his personal life, and he compares himself to the country of Germany and the German people as a whole. Uh, there's an excerpt over here from his book, and it says, the sacred mission of the German people to assemble and preserve the most valuable racial elements and raise them to the dominant position 
blah, 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 occupy themselves not merely with the breeding of dogs, horses, and cats, but also with care for the purity of their own blood. Ew. Blah, blah, blah. So Hitler ascribed international significance to the elimination of Jewish people, which, quote, must necessarily be a bloody process. What is he talking about? These are just little excerpts, but basically what he's doing is he's comparing humans to dogs. He's saying, look, if we can breed dogs to be more and more beautiful or more and more athletic or bigger or smaller or whatever, then let's apply that to humans. And he puts a lot of support behind a pseudo scientific field of eugenics. Pseudo scientific, remember, means fake science. And eugenics, it's like fake genetics. So what it does is it says, look, we know that if a tall person and a tall person have a baby, their baby's probably going to be tall. Or um, if two people with blue eyes have a baby, then the chances of the baby having blue eyes are much higher. Okay, all right. But the thing that's fake about it is the eugenics part, the part that says, if you have blue eyes, you're, I don't know, smarter than people with brown eyes. Or if you have a big nose, then you're a mean person or things like that, things that are not true. So he starts to associate, he and other eugenicists start to associate what people look like with who they are on the inside. And so um, this is the really dangerous part. They start to say that human appearance is a marker for your intelligence, a marker for your health, a marker for your morality. And this leads very quickly to racism. This also leads very quickly to his conflation with Jewish people and just like bad stuff. And also his idea that like Jewishness is somehow genetic and like inherited. And so it's more than just being anti a religion or an idea. It's a very pernicious, dangerous, scary thing. Literally, if you were breeding dogs and you had a dog that had a, a birth defect, you probably wouldn't on purpose breed that dog to have more babies. Hitler applies this to people. If a person is born with a birth defect, then he would say they are uh, not, they shouldn't be allowed to have children of their own because they are somehow defective. They are somehow not a good enough person to be allowed to live. Okay, so blaming the problems on other groups, let's get back to our question. Who does he blame? He blames inferior people. Not you. It's all those other people. Who are the other people? People who are genetically inferior. Okay, but who's that? So this poster in the middle kind of helps us identify that. This is a piece of propaganda against Jewish people. And it says here in the red, victory over Bolshevism and plutocracy means being freed from the Jewish parasite. What does that mean? Well, he's saying that Jewish people are the plutocracy. What's a plutocracy? It's the rich people. Also, it's saying Jewish people are the Bolsheviks, like the communists, which is really bizarre because usually rich people are not communist. So this poster is doing this really tricky thing where it's saying Jewish people are the rich people and Jewish people are the communists and all these things go together. And if we just get rid of this group of people, whoever they are, then our country will be better. And so it, this is the you know, NSDAP, that's the National Socialist D for German, A for worker in German party. So this is a poster for the Nazi party and it's saying we need to have victory over the communists, victory over the rich people, victory over the Jewish people. So who are to blame for the problems? The rich people, the communists, the Jews, also other people that he blames. Um, the Nazis blame you know, feminists for trying to ruin humanity. Um, gay people for trying to ruin humanity, disabled people for trying to ruin the German genetic superiority. Um, basically, anybody has somebody to blame. If you're Catholic, you can blame the Jews. If you're a man, you can blame feminists. If you're rich, you can blame the communists. If you're poor, you can blame the rich people. It doesn't matter who you are. There's someone that the Nazis will help you to feel better about yourself by blaming. And then that brings us to the last thing, the Reichstag fire. The Reichstag was the government building in Berlin. It was lit on fire by arsonists. A lot of people think probably it was the Nazis. But either way, the Nazi party blamed the Communist Party. And a lot of people started to hate the Communist Party who didn't hate it already because the communists were trying to attack Germany. 
and this helped the Nazis to gain power. Question number three, what did Hitler promise that appealed to people? Well, so we already said who he blamed that appealed to people. So what does he promise that's positive? All right, this takes us way back in history. Basically, he promises we're going to make Germany great again, like it said in the documentary that you hopefully already watched. All right, so when was it great before? Two different times in history. First, go all the way back to the year 800 uh, for the first German Reich. And a Reich, R-E-I-C-H, means empire. So the first empire was from the year 800 to 1806, when the German Empire controlled most of Europe. It was known as the Holy Roman Empire. It was the, the successor to the Roman Roman Empire, except for it was the Roman Empire plus Catholicism. So it was the Roman Empire, but Holy Roman Empire plus Jesus. And he consciously used these little sign thingies to associate the Nazis with the Roman Empire. Then the second German Reich, 1871 to 1918. This time period, the German Empire was a little bit smaller. You can see it doesn't include Austria, Hungary, or Italy, or some of these, you know, Burgundy, some of these places. But still, it's a pretty big empire. The second German Empire, um, associated with these like old fashioned dresses that, um, that Nazi women were supposed to wear. But then in 1918, that fell apart. That was um, destroyed. And so then he's promising that he will create a third German Reich. Oh, I can't get this out of the way. There we go. And he's going to promise Lebensraum. He's going to promise more living space, more living room for the German people. Here's Germany. It's going to take over the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia area, Austria. Poland, all those places, and he's going to give the German people living room. See this piece of propaganda here? Look at French people living in their country, British people living in their country, but Germany, we've got just so many people living in our tiny little country. We're so crowded. We need more room. We need to expand. We need to take over more space for our German people to live. Uh, interestingly, um, there's not really any statement about uh, what's going to happen to the people who are living there already. Although I think it's understood that those people will get uh, killed or pushed out. Um, some questions that students usually have, what happened to the first German Reich? Why did it leave? Why did it end? 1806, that should sound familiar. That's about when Napoleon started doing its stuff, his stuff. So France invaded and Napoleon conquered a bunch of places, took Germany until 1871 to unify. Then in 1918, what happened? Well, in 1914, Germany invaded France, uh, Germany and Russia fought, and at the end of World War I, the German Empire was taken apart and parts of it were given to France and to Poland and to all these other countries. So the Third Reich is gonna be building Germany back up again and giving German people more space. Number four, and our final question for today, how did Hitler keep total control over the thoughts and actions of the people? Some of these things are things you've probably already heard of, but we'll talk about them real quick. He had a group known as the SA. They were also known as the Stormtroopers or the Brown Shirts. They were mostly army veterans. And here's a picture of them over here. Similar to, to Mussolini's black shirts, these guys were, you know, thugs, gangsters, um, old guys, army veterans, regular people, all kinds of people who liked the Nazi ideas. If you uh, said bad things about the Nazi party, the brown shirts, the stormtroopers might come beat you up. Then once Hitler was elected to governmental power, he created the SS. And this SS or protection squad, um, they wore black uniforms, if you wanted to try to keep track of which was which, and they're kind of Hitler's personal army. They are recruited to be the most perfect people, um, you know, tall, blonde, all the things that Hitler thought were perfect. And they were kind of his personal army. They would find you and kill you if you were talking against the Nazi party. Um, they also policed each other. Um, so the SS could police the SA. And if anyone in the SA was not a loyal enough Nazi, not um, 
uh, not doing stuff according to the party line, then the SS could take you out. There was a famous event called the Night of the Long Knives, um, where hundreds of stormtroopers were shot. And this was reported in the US even. Um, so people knew this was happening. It was, uh, people knew that the Nazis were intimidating and um, beating up and taking out their rivals. There's another way that people were controlled. Um, these, this is a uniform and this is a poster for the HJ or the BDM, the Hitler Jugend uh, or the Bund Deutsche Mädel, the Hitler Youth or the League of German Girls. These are kind of sort of like um, youth groups or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, however you want to think about it. Super fun, super amazing, uh, super attractive uh, youth organizations for kids boys and girls, and you could go to these super fun summer camps and super fun after school programs. And uh, they give you uniforms, they would teach you fun activities. And um, it was very attractive to a lot of kids. And while you were at these fun activities, and they gave you super fun uniforms, they also brainwashed you into their ideas. So you basically turned a lot a whole army of kids into Nazis. Um, and then they would uh, police their families and friends. So they would snitch on their families for being not Nazi enough or their teachers or whoever else. Two more things, book burning. Pretty famously, the Nazis burned bonfires full of books that opposed them. So any books that promoted um, tolerance of multiculturalism, any books that promoted um, you know, treating gay people with respect or uh, promoted communism or any of the things that Hitler didn't like, they could be burned. And then last, but certainly not least, is the night of broken glass when Jewish businesses, homes, synagogues were targeted uh, for vandalism and arson. They were burned down, the windows broken, stuff stolen, uh, the people terrorized. Um, after all these things, um, a lot of Jewish people left Germany in fear for their lives and their safety. That is how Hitler kept control over the thoughts and actions of the people. There's your four questions. Hopefully your rapid response answers are complete. And now all you have to do is write a final summary paragraph. How did Adolf Hitler make Germany a totalitarian state controlled by the Nazi party?